Hey guys, it's Richie the WizKid here from the Best Darn Diddly Review Show, and I'm here to talk to you about PopThreads.com, your number one source for finding awesome nerdy t-shirts. Are you sick from not knowing what to wear when you go out with all your friends on the weekends? Well, don't have a cow, man. Go to PopThreads.com, and if you use the code SIMPSONS at checkout, you can save 15% on all your t-shirt needs. Hello again, everyone. Welcome back to the Best Darn Diddly Review Show. This is a weekly podcast for anyone who loves The Simpsons, or ever has loved The Simpsons, hosted by two dudes that grew up on The Simpsons. My name is Miles, better known as Mr. Mo's Days Off, and today we are back to a regular scheduled program. No clip shows for us. It is The Front, and joining me, as always, your co-host with the most, Richie the Wizkid. How you doing today, Rich? As usual, I am fine and dandy like sour candy. Everybody loves Ned, right? <laughs> Not me. <laughs> Everyone else loves Ned. <laughs> Everyone who cares loves Ned. <laughs> Counts. Whatever. We'll get to that eventually. <laughs> Fuck it. Fuck it. We're done. Show canceled. <laughs> See you next week, ladies and gentlemen. But no, I wanted to start off by saying I know this is obviously an episode that's not as long as the writers and producers wanted it to be because there's obvious gags that go on. What gives you in. that idea, sir? <laughs> a couple different things. <laughs> but as we're going to get into that, I do want to say I very, very much enjoyed this episode. Like, I really, really loved this one. I don't know if it was just the whole story in general. There's a lot of great grandpa lines in this. Homer wasn't the main character in the storyline, but this was a really fun episode. But anyways, we'll get into that here in just a second. I got to throw it back to you. I got to do my bit here. The man, the myth, the guy who won most improved odor at his high school reunion. It is Miles. I don't care if I didn't graduate. I am keeping that. Thank you very much. (laughs) I know, right? Like you already made it. And I could not agree with you more in terms of enjoyment on this episode. And for me personally, I know I know why that was. It's because. I didn't remember this episode even a little bit. I, I remembered it really? as I saw it. Once I once I saw what was happening, I knew I knew what episode it was, and I remembered it then. But coming on to this, <laughs> 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 but as I was prepping for this episode, and I just read the title of it, the title did not ring a bell even a little bit. So when no. I turned it on and started watching it, it really surprised me. I, I had no expectation. Yeah, you turned it up on. to it. And so that's what the secret was for me is not having any expectations at all is the absolute best. The only thing that might be better than that is having bad expectations and then being pleasantly surprised. But for the non expectations or the no expectations thing, that's a a great way to approach the episode, frankly. This is the first episode we've ever reviewed where in my guidebook, The Simpsons, a complete guide to our favorite family. I read the synopsis after I read the title because I had no idea what the episode was. And within like a a line and a half, I was like, oh, this one was on TV like a month ago and I watched it. But I just, the title, the front, like it really doesn't give anything away. So I wanted to know what I was going into. So I knew what to expect a little bit, but it was still like, I I loved this episode. And since we're coming up to the end of season four, we are getting close. We're getting very close. There's only like three or four episodes left, I think. But this is a good one to have right now. To just throw a wrench into, you know, your top five episode list quite possibly. <laughs> I know it's going to fuck with you a little bit. It might not fuck with me as much. This is just another <laughs> sleepless night for me. That's all that means. So let's go ahead and dive into this episode. We are talking about The Front from April 14th, 1993. If that title also doesn't ring a bell for you, don't worry. We're going to talk about everything right now. Starting with the chalk gag, which already a little bit of controversy, Rich. First of all. What I watched, I saw, said, I will not sell miracle cures, which made me laugh because just last week I referred to Bart as a snake oil salesman, I do believe, within the last (laughs) couple weeks. But according to IMDb, this episode's chalkboard sentence is, my pen is not a booger launcher. Well, if only I had some kind of book that had chalkboard gags written down for me, right? I didn't have to do anything except read. Oh, wait, I do. (laughs) Convenient. (laughs) And I show that it says, I will not sell miracle cures. Okay, so clearly IMDb fails again. That's, you know, IMDb is a great website, but we have noticed quite a few times there's been some errors in their trivia section. I don't really seem to edit or monitor that too heavily, do they? 
I guess not. I mean, I think it's public access for the most part. Like so. Wikipedia? I mean, <laughs> yeah, not that hardcore, but yeah, I think you can write your own stuff in there. And to be fair, though, I mean, my guidebook does get things wrong, as we've found numerous times. But I will point out that the name IMDb does stand for Internet Movie Database, and this is a TV show, so it gets a little a little break from me there. Touche. It's not the Internet Movie slash Simpsons TV history buff <laughs> website for people that have too much time on their hands. Well, and there is an entire Simpsons wiki I could just as easily use. I just like getting the uh, trivia sec- section from uh, IMDb. I love IMDb. I That's use it great. all the time. I'm really sad they got rid of the message boards, actually. They... they were too full of hate speech i guess for everybody's likings but i actually found them to be entertaining and sometimes they led to finding more information from other sites about various movies i was interested in fucking trolls randy many mo's out there he's just doing it for the laws i know but still (laughs) that's not randy that was uh oh shit you're right uh, yeah gerald gerald excuse me (laughs) don't put that name on randy randy (laughs) marsh is a treasure he's uh he was busy doing cock magic and Lady Gaga stuff. Wait, is he Lady Gaga? No, he's not. Lord, Lady Lord, Lord. Yeah, I Lord. am Lord. I am Lord. Lord, 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 Lord. All right. Yeah, we're doing a Simpsons podcast. Let's let's behave ourselves here. What? The couch gag on this one, as Richie already alluded to, they were running a little bit short on time, you could say. So this one does have that extended line dance circus couch gag sequence that they use anytime the episode needs a little bit of filler. Uh, and why did we have to learn so much about the show where I can nitpick it like that now? <laughs> the episode opens with the kids watching Cooking with Krusty, and we actually find out it is Krusty's birthday when the chef he was working with says that he went to his mother's and he, he got the recipe for a Jewish dish that he was fond of, but Krusty wasn't really having that. Ixnay on the OJ. He immediately cut to the cartoon and didn't want to get it out on the air that he had a Jewish heritage, I guess. I I don't know why. Even though they've seen him reconnect with his father on, on, on a couple of yeah, on a couple of occasions. <laughs> For whatever reason, after Krusty denies his heritage, we get this great bit where Lisa says it's so sad that Krusty's ashamed of his roots. <laughs> and I love that part because as soon as she says that, Homer walks in in front of the TV with a plunger stuck to his head. And this has clearly <laughs> happened before because he's yelling out, Marge, it happened again, as he's like knocking the plunger on the uh, the frame of the doorway. <laughs> and I wrote down, how many times do you think Homer's done this in the past? And we have to wonder how many times it will happen again before some unknown date in the future say like 50 years or so give or take (laughs) exactly (laughs) so then we get to see the best itchy and scratchy ever created arguably the opposite of that it's just the most boring itchy and scratchy you've ever seen literally itchy is just kind of bopping for lack of a better word because he's not even really hitting he's just bopping scratchy on the head every few seconds or so maggie would be ashamed maggie could swing that mallet down she really could. Lisa actually points out just how bad of an episode it is, but Bart's like, don't worry, they're building to something. <laughs> and they're not. Literally the only thing that happens other than that repetitive bopping is they both stop, look at the camera, and say, don't do drugs, kids, which is a terrible message to spread. <laughs> Clearly they could have used more drugs to make a better episode of Itchy and Scratchy. <laughs> at least more enjoyable. I, I found it at least moderately <laughs> entertaining. I liked Krusty's response when it cuts back to Krusty on live television, where he says, I could pull a better cartoon out of my Hey, kids, wasn't that a great cartoon? <laughs> yeah, that is really good. Uh, Lisa actually says the writers should be ashamed of themselves. <laughs> there were a lot of jokes at the actual writers of The Simpsons in this episode, weren't there? Uh, yeah, they, they were very self-deprecating in this episode in a, in a very fun way. I mean, it was it was a really... I think that was part of the reason I enjoyed it so much. And after watching the director's commentary, we'll talk about it a little later, There is there's probably a lot of stuff in this episode that went completely over our heads because they had so many little in-jokes throughout the, yep. uh, throughout the show. Your book may have caught some of them. We'll have to. We'll have to see. I believe it did. Very I believe cool. it did. I think I know what we're alluding to. Now we have secrets that our listeners don't know about. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Uh, after Lisa talks about how the writers should be ashamed of themselves, this bit is great because Bart actually says cartoons have writers, <laughs> and Lisa responds, "Eh, sort of." 
<laughs> yeah, that that's the what I was talking about where like the jabs at themselves kind of thing. Yeah, this is where they start for sure. Bart says that gives him an idea, and Lisa's like, "Are we thinking the same thing?" Bart's like, "I doubt it," because we flash <laughs> to what he's thinking about, and he's actually robbing Santa Claus, <laughs> literally at gunpoint. <laughs> yeah, he was. It's kind of a morbid thought, but still, at least he's got all the presents and no problem driving the reindeer. Of course, what Lisa meant was that they could actually write an episode of Itchy and Scratchy themselves and do a better job than the trash they just watched. Challenge accepted. Meanwhile, with the Simpsons' parents, we see Marge going through the bills. Well, I should say going through the mail, but it pretty much is all bills. One of them's like second notice, and then we see final notice, and then she gets one that just says some guys are coming. (laughs) Yeah, you can still go a few more notices after that. It takes the guys a while to get there. They're slow. At least two notices. <laughs> There's also a invitation in the mail for the high school reunion. It's the 20th, I believe, or 25th. I don't I didn't write that down. It's, it's one of the reunions that they will get an invitation for. But the weird thing is only Marge got an invitation. Homer didn't get one. Hmm, there must be some reason for this. This is where we see, just like in all the other season four episodes, not necessarily the best moment in this one, but a moment where Homer has an internal discussion with his own brain. This is it, Homer. Time to tell the terrible secret from the past. I ate all the fancy soap from the bathroom. Then Marge says, oh my god, and then Homer's brain goes, no, the other secrets. I never graduated high school. That still doesn't explain why you ate my soap. Wait, maybe it does. (laughs) (laughs) Homer goes on to say that he never passed remedial science 1A. (laughs) Homer, you failed science, but aren't you a nuclear technician? Marge, ixne on the ucular ne ecnitionte. What does that mean? I don't know, I failed Latin too. (laughs) Which he spoke like perfect (laughs) Latin right there. Well, pig Latin, that's not fucking Latin. (laughs) That's not the same language. Pig Latin is like Homer Latin. Come on now. (laughs) I like that they were using pig Latin a couple times here than the first few moments of the episode, too. (laughs) Keep it all parallel. Such a good gag, it really was. And Marge had a very good point, though. That's actually quite terrifying (laughs) and, and might explain some of the future close calls that Springfield has. With its uh, nuclear safety technician. He already had a close call. He eeny, meeny, miny, moed his way out of it. That's one of many. <laughs> we all remember the push the any key, right? We'll get there, too. Where's the any key? <laughs> what I wanted to point out before we move on is the opening to this scene is an exterior shot of the Simpsons' house outside. And this is one of those moments, again, where you're not quite sure of the layout of the whole Simpsons' property because it shows a tree it's from the outside front of the Simpsons' house. It shows a tree in the back right of the backyard with the treehouse in it. Whereas in other episodes, it shows it in the back left part. So again, we might have some continuity issues here. Never quite sure where the tree in the backyard is in the the Grapes of Wrath episode. The cops pull up and it's in the back left, I'm pretty sure, in that episode. So never 100% certain where the tree is actually at. We also know the tree changes from purple to brown at some point. So there's definitely some weird shit happening in the Simpsons' backyard. Maybe it's a multiverse. We don't know which which Simpsons we're watching. It's so close to the nuclear power plant that the tree's just radioactive. That's probably just as likely. He gets up and moves in the middle of the night. It's Groot. <laughs> when we get <laughs> when we get back to Bart and Lisa, Lisa's reading a book, How to Get Rich Writing Cartoons. <laughs> Seems like a pretty good read. She discovers that first they're going to need a setting. And it just so happens, Bart's looking out the window, and he sees Homer trimming the hedges while Marge is lounging in the yard reading a book with her hair in a very precarious position. (laughs) And so nothing ensues, and Bart's idea goes down the tubes, because that's just the way the Simpsons go. Of course, that's not the case. Homer accidentally clips off the top of Marge's hair, which (laughs) grows back surprisingly fast later. Or she must just have, like, extensions on hand. Or when she's asleep, Homer puts more sticks in her hair to hold it up. (laughs) (laughs) That's right. (laughs) He does prop it up with a stick. I guess that's how it, uh, that's how it helps. Puts, like, a branch into her hair and then puts the top of her hair back on. But it's, like, still leaning forward like it's about to fall off. (laughs) Yeah, he had to have cleaned that up at some point. Cover your tracks, Homer. (laughs) 
This activity does, however, inspire Bart. He points out he's got a great idea for a setting. Let's see what happens to Itchy and Scratchy in a barber shop. And at first, they come up with a fairly generic story. It's not bad, but Scratchy's getting a shave, and Itchy cuts his head off with a knife. Bart points out, though, that that's pretty predictable, and he thinks they can do better. So instead, they pitch an idea where... Itchy replaces the shampoo with barbecue sauce and then releases fire ants onto Scratchy's head. Ouch. No big battle happened there. They literally, like, completely clean down his flesh all the way to the bone where you just they see eat a his very face clean off. cat skull. They do. They bath salts that motherfucker. <laughs> That's very true. And it's actually quite comical. It feels very itchy and scratchy. Absolutely. Uh, right off the bat, they already have a more creative venture, especially compared to what they started with. It at least competes with some of the plots that the, the very in-depth and nuanced show of Itchy and Scratchy has. Well, that's not even the end of the episode either, because then Itchy raises the, the seat to where Scratchy goes through the roof to upstairs where there's an Elvis impersonator. Actually, sir, the commentators wanted to make it very, very, very clear that that was not Elvis. That wasn't even an Elvis impersonator, because that could theoretically be enough with how strict the rights on Elvis are to be placed in the show. So just just for all of those watching at home, they wanted to make it very clear that that was in no way, shape, or form the likeness of Elvis. Okay, well, it was a, a <laughs> lookalike of his twin brother, Pelvis. <laughs> <laughs> but Scratchy's head goes through the TV, and then this someone they impersonates somebody else that will remain nameless, pulls out a gun and shoots Scratchy's head. Shout out to Pelvis Wesley. <laughs> <laughs> So after the episode is successfully written, the only thing left to do is determine whose name is going to go first. Both Bart and Lisa seem to think it should be them. Bart suggests they have a race around the world to see who gets the honors, and he even thinks they could get Queen Elizabeth to drop the flag. Look, there's only one way to settle this. Rock, paper, scissors. I love this moment because, like father, like children, both Bart and Lisa have a moment where they talk to their own brains. Lisa says, poor predictable Bart always takes rock. Good old rock. Nothing beats that. And then they do their one, two, three, and Bart goes, rock! <laughs> and Lisa, of course, picked paper, which beats rock. Don't! <laughs> Again, like father, like son. <laughs> well, they both showed a little instance of being like Homer and that with the internal monologue part. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, definitely. I wanted to point out, we forgot to mention, when they saw Homer with the plungers on their head, they had this conversation where they said, what are you going to change your name to when you grow up? <laughs> yeah, Lisa did Lois Sanborn. And Bart chose Steve Bennett. <laughs> Good plan, kids. <laughs> Gotta get away from that last name at some point. So now for the first time this episode, we are going to Itchy and Scratchy Studios, where we see Roger Myers Jr. reading over some scripts and yelling, You call this writing? And this is where we get in some great little digs at the Simpsons writers themselves, <laughs> a lot of whom went to Harvard, and they really, really poked a lot of fun at that. Yeah, right they now. did. <laughs> <laughs> That's an I didn't even need a guide. My guidebook didn't even point that part out. It's just from all the conversations we've had about how many Simpsons writers went to Harvard, you knew this is another jab at themselves here. I love how after Roger Myers bashes this writer, he starts to defend himself, saying, but at Harvard, we learn, he's like, Get out of my office, Egghead. Maybe you should have majored in not getting fired. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good career choice. It's a great major. I yeah. should have uh, looked into that. <laughs> <laughs> Just then, he actually gets Bart and Lisa's script delivered to him, but it's written directly from Bart and Lisa, and it presents themselves as children, so he almost immediately just completely dismisses it. Well, and Lisa was, was sucking up for like the whole first paragraph of the letter, too. True, yeah. It was it was obviously written by a youth, we'll say. Even though it had a great episode within it, he never even got to that part of it. She didn't write to the, of the audience. cover letter. Exactly. And they didn't they didn't play that up very well. He did think of a very funny way to get rid of the script, however. He calls the Harvard egghead back into his office and tells him to sing Fair Harvard. As soon as he starts to sing and opens his mouth, Roger Myers Jr. just wads up the paper and throws it down his throat. <laughs> 
I remember the first time I saw this episode, I thought the writer was going to take that piece of paper and read it and end up stealing the idea. <laughs> I don't. I don't know why. I just it's kind of like the itchy and that scratchy. That would be more like a movie plot if they had more time for it, right? But it'd be like the itchy and scratchy versus Marge episode where like they see her outside and take advantage of the of the circumstances. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I can't remember the name of when people are out there fighting against you. What is that called? Protesting. Protesting. When Marge is protesting, <laughs> and then they wrote her in as a character in the show. True. Yeah, the annoying little beaver or squirrel or whatever she was. <laughs> Instead, though, this Harvard writer just takes the wad out of his mouth and says, you have the manners of a Yelly. Throwing a couple of jabs at <laughs> Yell in there as well. I just like that when the conversation started with the writer in the room, Roger Myers said, if I puked in a fountain pen and mailed it to the monkey house, I'd get a better script. <laughs> Bart and Lisa quickly realized that they were rejected due to the fact that they're children, so they instantly realized if they could get an adult's name on their script, they'd have a much better chance of getting it made. And Bart immediately thought to go to Grandpa Simpson. After all, he let those two guys have his checkbook for an entire year. <laughs> When the kids get to the Springfield Retirement Castle, we see that Grandpa Simpson is right in the middle of writing a strongly worded letter. He's telling Modern Bride that he's upset that he never sees any elderly folks. When I read your magazine, I don't see one wrinkled face or a single toothless grin. For shame. <laughs> Modern Bride magazine. <laughs> The reason the kids are there is they want to know his first name. At first, Grandpa is scared that they're making his tombstone, <laughs> but it turns out that they just need his name to put it on the script. Grandpa has a hard time remembering, however, but lucky for him, he writes all of his important information down on his underwear. <laughs> so he reaches into his pants and very much Zoolander style just rips his whitey tidies out and yet another moment of Simpsons did it. He starts that by saying, well, whenever I'm confused, I just check my underwear. It holds the answer to all the important questions. But then after he pulls his underwear off, Zoolander style, or I guess Zoolander does it Simpson style. Truth. Lisa says, how'd you take off your underwear without taking off your pants? I don't know. The way Grandpa delivers that line, it's the way I always remember, I don't know. Because he literally goes, I don't know. Like, he so genuinely like doesn't remember. And it's just it has so funny. no clue. It's great. Again, three words, but delivered so beautifully and <laughs> funny. And this time when Roger Myers gets the script, he absolutely loves it. It was the same exact script as before, but now it is credited to Abraham Simpson. The script was made into a cartoon and Grandpa was due to be paid. Only thing is, nobody had a clue who Abraham Simpson was. They don't really know how this comedy writer had never made an impression on the studio since his script was so good. Roger Meyer's assistant gives Abe a call at the retirement castle. They, they get him on the phone, and when asked, Are you the Abraham Simpson that wrote the Itchy and Scratchy cartoon? Itchy and what? I'm sorry, but we have a very big check for whoever wrote this cartoon. That's right, I did the Iggy. <laughs> Oh, my, I, I love this little bit with him. Grandpa, it's just like a clueless grandpa, but as soon as he gets the opportunity to make some money, he, like, snaps out of the senility. Or he did the Iggy way back when. <laughs> he had some really good lines in this episode. Grandpa Simpson is one of the characters that jumps out more and more to me as we watch the, as we revisit this episode, much like Burns and Flanders. I think Grandpa, I, I appreciated him as a child, but I think there's some things that I appreciate now. more now, yeah. for sure. Is it because we're becoming old and senile? <laughs> it very well could be. <laughs> then we get back to our B-plot where we see Homer looking through his old high school yearbook. He's reminiscing about all the good times, and he's looking at himself when he sees his quote was, I can't believe I ate the whole thing. <laughs> it also lists activities. None. Sports, none. And honors, none. Definitely to, none. <laughs> to which Homer replies, so many memories. <laughs> hey, Homer lived a very eventful high school career at the end. Apparently. He did become a parent. Yes, you're right. You see what I did there? I do see what you did there. <laughs> Was that apparent to you? 
In fact, they're appealing him off the pavement right now. <laughs> they're apparenting him off the pavement. There's this really funny bit here when Marge and Homer are reminiscing about high school. Homer starts talking about all his old chums he's going to get to visit, like Potsy, Ralph Mouth, and the Fawns. That's happy days. No, Marge, not all of them were happy days. Like that time Pinky Tuskadero wrecked the motorcycle. Or the time I lost all my money to a card shark. And my dad, Tom Bosley, had to win it back for me. <laughs> <laughs> That's my favorite line in the entire episode. But did you catch what happened immediately angry. after that? Immediately after that, we open on the high school reunion sign where the quote is, Hey, sit on it. <laughs> Like, I thought that was 74. very, very, very funny. We're like, you think the joke's over, and then immediately they cut to a little tie-in joke where obviously you have to know Happy Days or you're not going to get it. Happy Days used to be one of my favorite shows to watch on Nick at Night back yeah, in the day. Yeah, so, we all so much that. fun. And you know what? I even like the episode where they jump a fucking shark. I was going to say, they literally jumped a shark in an episode. <laughs> that's, that's where that phrase came from. That's yeah. actually the first one. That That moment many, many fans considered to be the death of the show and from then on, anytime you would reach that breaking point in a series, they would say that show is Jump the Shark. Hey. When Homer and Marge arrive at the high school reunion, Principal Dondelinger greets them with, Oh, Miss Bouvier, it's so nice to see you. And then looks at Homer and says, I'm sorry, sir, we're not allowing vagrants into the gymnasium tonight, but we will be putting some scraps out at the back of the building. So. <laughs> Oh, Homer, it's you. <laughs> I love that's how he knew who it was. <laughs> yeah, that's great. And immediately he's like, ugh. He's, he's, he's even more disappointed that it's not just a random vagrant. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Once we get inside the reunion, we see a familiar face. Artie Ziff. Ugh, not a familiar voice, though. No, it's not. Very good catch on that, sir. This was the only time that John Lovitz wasn't able to play the character, and Dan Castellaneta, a.k.a. Homer Simpson himself, had to step in. I thought he did a pretty good job imitating, though. Yeah, it's just, after Artie's been in so many more episodes, and he, he's not an iconic character, but he's a very important character, I would say, it just kind of like caught me off guard, because I just when I saw him, I expected it to be John Lovitz. And when he first started talking, I was like, oh, oh, no, that's not him. Something's just a little bit off. Yeah, it doesn't sound right. It's funny, though, because their little interaction is actually foreshadowing for a yes, upcoming Simpsons episode down the road. Essentially, Artie tells the Simpsons how successful and rich he is. And Homer is just like, I bet you'd trade it all for one night with my wife. And he admits that he would. And we will see him put his money where his mouth is down the road. Yes, we will. Or his money where his mouth wants to be or something, I don't know. Oh, nice. I see what you did there, too. <laughs> so when the when the Simpsons creators and writers and producers run out of ideas, they steal ideas from themselves. <laughs> That's not <laughs> actually entirely false. We'll talk more on that at the end of the show. But for right now, we're still at the high school reunion, and they've got one of the former students who I guess is doing his best at being a stand-up comic. Really, he's just doing a lot of impersonations of various celebrities like Cheech and Chong, for one. Dave's not here, man. <laughs> Homer's not here, man. <laughs> I, whenever we play Friday the 13th and Jason's knocking down the door that I'm at, I usually go, Dave's not here, man. <laughs> That's badass. Nobody, actually. nobody fucking gets it either. I've never heard you say that. Oh, yeah. I say that all the time, man. It's been a while since I played, but yeah. Yeah, it's true. That's true. So this whole little bit, I think you'll find this part interesting. This is actually poking a little bit of fun at Hank Azaria, because that essentially was Hank Azaria in high school. In fact, in his senior year, Hank Azaria did a talent show for the school where he did a series of Steve Martin impersonations and <laughs> other other celebrities in the in the same manner that this student did for the high school reunion. Oh, everyone's getting made fun of in this episode. They, they are. They're spreading it around a lot. It's kind of fun. This is actually where we get to what we talked a little bit about earlier, where Homer's actually going to take home a few awards. He's due, damn it. He is, and he earned these. He's gained the most weight for one. That's one trophy. And when asked how he did it, he declares, I discovered a meal between breakfast and brunch. <laughs> <laughs> he also picks up the award for most improved odor. 
We also see him get the Travel the Least Distance Award, which he proudly declares it's not easy sitting in your rut. Couldn't Marge possibly be up for that award, too? Shouldn't they be literally the exact same distance? Because it would be traveled from their home together to the school. But Well, guess, they're poking fun at Homer through this whole ordeal, so that's what it is. It, it all comes down to that. But yeah, I, I agree. That one should have been a tie. But hey, they'd be sitting on the same table. Here's the thing, though. Between the second and third award that you mentioned, it cuts. There's a little bit of quick time that passes right there. It goes from having two awards to like six or seven at the end there. And my guidebook here has the other awards listed, which you said most weight gain and most impro- and most improved odor. He also had most hair lost, oldest car, lowest paying job, and then least distance traveled. <laughs> which I thought he made a decent amount of money at the nuclear power plant. So if that's the lowest paying job out of that whole class. They're all doing pretty well, I would think. Yeah, that's pretty awesome, actually, because he's. I think he's doing pretty good, we figured out a few times. Yeah. Or just incredibly, incredibly bankrupt. Unfortunately, it's this moment that Principal Dondlinger comes back out and declares he's been looking through the class of 74's old records for some reason. Yeah, I know, because he's mad at Homer. (laughs) He's discovered that Homer Simpson never passed Remedial Science 1A and therefore did not graduate and therefore was going to have all of his awards revoked. What a dick move. Like, <laughs> he doesn't care about the actual education of one of his former students. He just wants to strip him of his moment of glory. I love how Homer's just really distraught because he really feels like he earned that most improved odor trophy. <laughs> <laughs> that's an important one for sure. That's that's probably the best one. We also <laughs> see a very drunk and slobberly looking Barney Gumble who's popped his cummerbund and is still saying, oh, I can't believe how pathetic that guy is. And then when asked, hey, where is your cummerbund? He's, he looks a little bit down and says, uh, I dropped it in the toilet. <laughs> Poor Barney. Now we're back at the Itchy and Scratchy Studios where Abe and Roger Myers are having a bit of a meeting. Roger Myers is very surprised that Abe is a writer. This is the first time they're meeting face to face. He says, you're pretty old. And Abe just responds, where's my check? <laughs> yep, you're a writer, all right. <laughs> Uh, Roger Myers is actually really impressed with Abe. He likes his style and he loves the fact that he's not some yuppie Harvard writer who thinks he knows it all. He's got some real life experience, Rich. He actually takes Abe to the writer's room and this is where there are probably at least a dozen little inside hen jokes poking fun at a lot of the people involved with the creative process of The Simpsons including people like Al Jean and Mike Reese and a load of others. And they're all animated with little inside jokes, things like one of them is holding two cups of coffee because he was known for just pounding coffee throughout the day and other more subtle and more serious jokes as well. Again, a very heavy episode and poking fun of those writers, but that's awesome. Like if I was immortalized in Simpsons form on the show, that could be like the greatest honor. I actually really love to Roger Myers is actually saying how you guys have your fancy degrees. You should learn from this man's life experience. And one of the writers depicted who looked a lot like Al Jean speaks up and says, I actually wrote my thesis on life experience. And Roger Myers throws his nameplate at him. <laughs> Did Al Jean actually do that? Uh, no, it was not his voice, but it was in his like. No, no, no. I meant like, was this thesis actually about life experience? Oh, it did. It did not mention that. So I, I, I would say I doubt that because he was on the commentary. This was just a, a pretty good joke. That would be like us making fun of Doctor Andy Bassanio for having his degree. <laughs> exactly. But how epic is it that Bart and Lisa got to write a highly popular episode of their favorite show? Well, and how cool is it they're actually going to get to watch it at their same crusty time, same crusty channel, even though they kind of fucked that up a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, that's, the whole experience just has to be like mind boggling for them. It really like, is. And, you know, I was going to save this for the end, but that actually makes me want to talk about something pretty, pretty amazing right now, because the inspiration for this episode actually came from I want to say it was Mike Reese and Abe and Al Jean. I, I, it was one of those two of the showrunners. They actually were watching 2020 that did a special covering a, a real life occurrence in the 90s where three 12-year-old girls 
actually wrote an episode or a script, I should say, for Tiny Toon Adventures. And through just one of these amazing feel good stories of just a combination of grit and luck, these girls actually sent their script in and the right person happened to read it and thought it was such a good script and a cool story that he slipped it onto Steven Spielberg's desk. He ended up reading it. He ended up loving it. He ended up flying those three girls out to the production studios for a week, paying them a week's salary at the actual rate that he was paying his writers, and of course gave them a VIP experience with a tour and getting to meet a lot of the people that worked on a show that they loved, and they actually ended up turning that script into a show that actually aired back in the 90s. I think that is amazing. I love Tiny Toon Adventures. Me too. I watched the crap out of that when I was a kid. And me as well. And actually, the uh, old NES games was one of my favorites. Yes. I, don't, I don't know if it would hold up or not. I haven't played in a while, but that used to be one of my, my favorite games. I remember running a Nintendo to play that game. <laughs> but yeah, I just thought that was such a neat story. And you're absolutely right. That would just, especially as a 10 and an 8-year-old or these three 12-year-olds in this case, that would be absolutely amazing. And I thought it was really cool that this story was inspired by real life. Yeah, that is very cool. That's a nice little story segue there. Absolutely. Uh, unfortunately, while they're watching it, though, and trying to adjust the volume, Lisa does accidentally change the channel, so they miss a good chunk of their show. I thought that was kind of funny. I I think it's because they didn't want to replay the same footage that we saw earlier in the episode. That's the only reason I could come up with this gag. That actually makes a lot of sense. They do, however, show the end credit sequence, which was actually a real-life spoof of many shows produced by Stephen Cannell, where Cannell sits at his typewriter in his office and he throws a sheet of paper into the air. Uh, you've probably seen that on various shows that you watched back in the day. I know I remember it. I don't. I couldn't remember what shows are from, but I do remember the sequence. One little cool fact about this, though, is Mike Reese was the one that came up with this idea, and he later met Cannell. And from what Mike Reese says, Cannell was so pleased with that joke that he actually just stopped and hugged Reese right there in that moment. <laughs> It seems like people are either 100% in on The Simpsons this time or really, really mad and 0% in. And more times than not, it's the 100%. You get the occasional person that's a little upset, but from everything that we've learned over the four seasons so far, it seems like people are really, really happy when they get poked fun at in The Simpsons for the most part. I mean, honestly, in a lot of ways, I couldn't think of a better honor. I I, I mean, that's such a cool thing. I'm still hoping that they animate us and do an episode for just this little quick gag. Yeah, we gotta keep this show going long enough to get noticed by somebody. <laughs> <laughs> we have quite a bit more to cover, but we'll be right back after hearing from our Pottern family. Good evening, future passengers. Are you ready to sit back, relax, and join us on a ride of epic proportions through the mystical land of randomness? Am I a serial killer if I eat Lucky Charms? What would it be like if horror characters ran a gym? Who would run spin class? When a shark jumps out of the water, is it like suffocating for that split second? So join us every week for a brand new derailment with Goobs, Ripkin, and Jenny Bean. You can follow us on Twitter and Instagram at The Derailers. And don't forget to subscribe to us on iTunes, Stitcher, and also on YouTube. Have a great night or day, folks. So back to the episode, Homer actually is going to confess to his children that he never graduated high school. But first, he's he's kind of embarrassed and he's he's a little bit hesitant. But Bart says, Dad, we're going to love and respect you no matter what. Which is an odd thing for Bart to say. Very it strange. Sounded like, it sounded believable, too. It sounded sincere. It did. And then, of course, as soon as Homer shares his secret, Bart just starts laughing and ridiculing him. <laughs> Pisses Homer off and he starts choking him in a classic moment between father and son. Why you little? <laughs> but it's interrupted by the doorbell ringing and Homer answers the door to see Grandpa in a very impressive suit. Zoot suiting it up. Yeah, he looks sharp. He's telling Homer all about his new job, where he gets $800 a week to tell a cat and mouse what to do. Which is, what, $40,000 a year, Tops? I mean, I would take that job right now. I love this little sequence we get with Homer fantasizing about literally taking his grandpa, who's just making, like, crazy man noises and gibberish speaking, essentially. (laughs) He's in a wheelbarrow, and he dumps him off at a building that says Nut House and rocks (laughs) and then just runs off. (laughs) Well, the only thing you hear him say is, I get $800 a week to tell a cat and mouse what to do. So yeah, that sounds completely insane. It does. It sounds a little bit off. Obviously, the kids know exactly what's going on, and they actually want to 
talk to Grandpa alone if Homer doesn't mind. Homer says that's fine, but if he starts wigging out, try to trap him in the cellar. (laughs) Full proof plan. (laughs) I love this little sequence here because Bart and Lisa are explaining to Grandpa what the the situation is, why why they're getting checks, that, that they're writing scripts and putting his name on it, but they don't do the entire plan. They just cut to the very end of the conversation but the way it's done, you can very clearly tell that they've they've said everything. It just it just shows us. Then we put your name on the script and send it in. Didn't you wonder why you're getting checks for doing absolutely nothing? <laughs> I just figured the Democrats were in power again. <laughs> <laughs> Fucking grandpa. <laughs> it goes on and they decide to do a three way split, but first before he agrees, Abe needs to sleep on it. Bart pokes at his grandpa and wakes him up almost immediately after he falls asleep. Why'd you wake me up? I was having a good dream. I was queen of the Old West. I kept a six-shooter in my garter, I did. (laughs) Bart doesn't even react to this ridiculous dream that Abe just claimed to have. He just says, do we have a deal? And Abe says, sure, and then immediately falls back asleep, and we actually get to see this sequence. (laughs) Abe runs out between two gunmen dueling in a full-on dress, just like the Wild Wild West, and he starts screaming, boys, boys, stop fighting. Both of you can marry me. (laughs) This isn't the first time Grandpa will be dressed up in drag, either. No, it's actually a reoccurring theme throughout the series. Back at the studio, Bart and Lisa are actually in Abe's office working on another script, but when Roger Myers Jr. walks by, he just assumes they're playing on their granddad's typewriter and offers them a tour of the studio. He asks Abe if he'd like to come along, but Abe's like, are there any steps? Just one. Ah, nuts to you. He's got a perfectly good desk. You can see that right there. So I understand. He snoozes off again. The kids are actually stoked, though. They get to go and see where their favorite cartoon is made. And I love, first of all, the hallway they go through is very much intentionally designed to look like Disney Animation Studios, where many of the writers have at least visited or worked in briefly. So there's just a little bit of homage to Disney there. But the best part is they're walking through a hallway Roger Myers Jr. is explaining that sometimes animators save money by repeating background sequences over and over again. And literally, (laughs) as they're saying this, we see him passing the same water cooler and janitor in the background. And I think a doorway as well. But it's just the same same thing over over and over over again. Not to the family guy extent. No, I know. Just long enough where it's funny. Great way. Yeah, absolutely great joke. Meanwhile, Homer is still trying to resolve this remedial science 1A class. He's at an adult education center where he's actually taking a class with Principal Dondelinger, who says he's only taking up teaching again because his wife had passed away and he was trying to fill his time. Homer raises his hand and asks, is this going to be on the test? test? (laughs) Dondelinger says, of course not. And then we see Homer actually scratching out the words dead wife in his notebook. (laughs) Uh, At least he was paying attention. (laughs) Yeah, good for Homer taking notes, right? (laughs) But it was like really big and took up a lot of space and he just wrote two words. We only briefly touch on this Homer going to school plot because we're back on the Krusty the Clown show where we're introducing Abraham Simpson's second Itchy and Scratchy episode. This one's entitled Screams from a Mall. And this one may be even better than the first. Actually, I I stand by the fact that it absolutely is. We see Itchy nail Scratchy's feet to an escalator. And then there's that terrifying looking sharp edge you always see on escalators. And of course, with your your feet pinned, what ends up happening is Krusty... Krusty? (laughs) Scratchy ends up getting skinned alive. It pulls the skin right off of his body. It doesn't stop there, though, because Itchy actually goes and sells the fur. We then see a rich couple buy said fur, but Scratchy takes it back. He shows up with no skin. It's just kind of like Inside Out Boy from the old Nickelodeon show, if you ever saw that. (laughs) So you can see all of his insides, but Scratchy wraps his own fur around his body, and when he leaves the ball, one last little cherry on top, there's a protest going on from a PETA-like organization with signs saying, Fur is murder, and the protesters start to beat up Scratchy, who is literally wearing his own fur. I really, really like the way that episode ended. It was really well done, yeah. A little extra twist at the end. Yeah, I I like that a lot. 
it this is where it kind of cuts back and forth a little bit between the a and b plot because we're back with homer and maybe the worst science experiment possible for someone like homer because principal dondelinger is going to demonstrate how much sugar is in a donut by burning how many it calories? yeah yeah you're right how many calories now I'm uh, going to burn this donut to show you how many calories it has. No! The bright blue flame indicates this is a particularly sweet donut. <laughs> this is not happening! This is not happening! Literally Homer's worst fears. <laughs> yeah, like I said, that, that has to be probably the worst thing Homer could witness. See, maybe if they like killed his own kid in front of him, he'd be slightly more <laughs> upset. They're, he's not learning anything, though. They're literally showing him how dangerous donuts are. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe my favorite moment with Abe in this episode is up next, because we see him in his office, but he's not working on Itchy and Scratchy. He's actually writing yet another strongly worded letter, this time to the government. He demands that they eliminate three states, because there's just too many of them. <laughs> he also points out that he is not a crackpot. Is this the scene where he actually breaks down in front of Roger Myers Jr. and says, like, I'm a fraud? <laughs> so Roger Myers comes in and is like, good news, Abe, you've been nominated for an award, and you're so good at this, I'm actually firing all of the other writers. <laughs> the entire future of the company rests on your shoulders. Abe starts to break down, he's crying, no, no, I'm a fraud, I'm a fake, I can't do this. I'm sorry, I didn't catch any of that, and now I gotta go. <laughs> <laughs> On the night of the award show, we see Grandpa in the mirror getting himself ready, and I love this little moment because he says in the mirror to himself, it's an amazing country he lives in where somebody who once took a shot at Teddy Roosevelt can bounce back the way he did, which is extra funny when you consider that Teddy Roosevelt was actually shot once before he actually ended up giving a like hour-long speech with the bullet still in him because Teddy Roosevelt yep. was possibly the most badass president of all time. And we'll actually see an episode in the future where Superintendent Chalmers actually installs in a lot of the young boys the ideals of Teddy Roosevelt and tries to get them to go outside in nature. So oh, yeah. somewhere in the writer's room, they really, really like They have a lot of respect for their presidents, yeah. Yeah. Then we get that cutback to the classroom where Homer's about to take his true-false test, right? <laughs> well, we get this moment before the test begins where Homer has a little exchange with his brain again where he says, All right, brain, you don't like me and I don't like you, but let's just do this and I can get back to killing you with beer. And then Homer's brain goes, it's a deal. <laughs> That's when Don Blinger starts passing out the tests. And he says, this will be 50 questions. This will all be true or false. True. Homer, I was just describing the test. True. Look, Homer, just take the test and you'll do fine. False. <laughs> <laughs> He's off to a good start. <laughs> yeah, 100% on those first three. Absolutely. Well, now it's time for the big award show, and it's actually Krusty the Clown and Brooke Shields hosting. It's the star of pair. the Blue Lagoon and the Blue-Haired Goon. <laughs> Krusty is, of course, pissed off because his hair is green, not blue, and he's already angry at these bullshit writers for tonight. <laughs> <laughs> Again, another joke. <laughs> Let's just get on to the nominees for Best Cartoon. The other nominees for Best Writing in a Cartoon Series were... Strongdar, Master of the Calm, The Wedding Episode. Action Figure Man, the How to Buy Action Figure Man episode. <laughs> that literally was literally a mother and son. A, a jab at the Transformers. It looked like the old Transformer cartoon. <laughs> and we also have Ren and Stimpy, season premiere. But, <laughs> but did you not found? <laughs> but not yet done or something yeah. like that. <laughs> Which I thought was a throwback to the time they tried to use the Ren and Stimpy clip. Yeah, I thought that might be a bit particular. of payback. Yeah, I, I got yeah. the same impression. And then finally it showed Abe Simpson's clip of Itchy and Scratchy. Kids, cross my fingers for me. Oh, that's gonna hurt come winter. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's probably true. Of course, Abe's cartoon does win, and they actually play it for everybody in the audience, and the entire crowd absolutely loves it. But Abe doesn't seem to respond quite the same way. Surely he's watched an episode of Itchy and Scratchy before since he writes for him. <laughs> he actually starts his speech saying, That's the first time I've ever seen Itchy and Scratchy, and I didn't like it one bit. He claims that it's too violent and that anybody who likes it is disgusting. He actually basically tells all the crowd that they disgust him, and he walks off the stage. 
And then we get one little last bit of these inside jokes with the writers I absolutely love because we get a couple of writers in the crowd that look a lot like Al Jean and Mike Reese. And one says the other, oh my god, he's right. I'm done with this. I'm going to go write that sitcom I dreamed of of a sassy robot. Which, uh, <laughs> another little interesting tidbit of foreshadowing there, because can you think of anybody involved with The Simpsons who wrote a sitcom about a sassy robot? Something about homeboys from outer space? <laughs> of course, we're talking about Bender from Futurama, which I can't say for certain that this moment inspired that, but it is funny to think <laughs> about that this happened years before Futurama premiered. Simpsons did it. Before Simpsons did it. <laughs> the ultra meta joke we also see that homer got the good news that he passed his science class so the simpsons reset occurs true all is well everything is back to normal and homer declares that at the next reunion he'll have nothing to be ashamed of (laughs) or so he thought (laughs) and then it's 2024 which is actually only seven Seven years years away away. (laughs) (laughs) but was much further away in the future at the time that this aired and in 2024 the 50th high school reunion for homer and marge homer shows up and he's greeted by principal dondelinger who immediately says simpson do you have a plunger on your head (laughs) don't and we get one of those throwback jokes with homer with the plunger on his head like at the very beginning of the episode a great throwback joke all the way back to the beginning and we end with marge just groaning in embarrassment yeah, marge was kind of marge was kind of rough on homer throughout this episode i felt like yeah a little bit she she, she, had but a lot she of was also really embarrassed thing. in front of a lot of people hey she didn't travel the least distance to get to that place <laughs> or she was maybe she's mad that she was robbed out of that award <laughs> <laughs> That is the end of the episode, sort of, for the first and only time ever. They actually do a little short animation bit at the end, because this episode ended up, even with the extended couch gag, a full minute short. So, they took inspiration (laughs) (laughs) from the Archie comic series that would oftentimes do an extra half-panel short story. Basically, any time their comics would end on a half-panel, They would just do a short story that was related to nothing else going on with various characters from the Archie, Riverdale, whatever you want to call it, universe. Uh, So it was taken from that, and as a little bit of homage, the the font in Ned Flanders on his little show opening sequence is actually the same font as the Archie comics. Hens love roosters, geese love ganders, everyone else loves Ned Flanders. Not me. Everyone who counts loves Ned (laughs) Flanders. It's actually a really funny little bit, too. Uh, Ned comes into his kid's room who declared that they're not going to church today. (gasps) What? You give me one good reason. And Rod and Todd start giggling and say, because it's Saturday. (laughs) Well, ugly duckly do. And then it plays the theme song again. (laughs) So weird little ending, and they totally admit it. It's just because they fell short. But ultimately, this is still a really great episode. It's surprising to me that it came short with how many times i found myself just cracking up at how many jokes were in this episode uh, again very limited expectations because of lack of memory of what this one was about but it just was beginning to end hilarious so great episode in my opinion rich did you or that book of yours have anything else you wanted to add before we get on out of here well me personally like i said at the top i i love this episode this episode was so funny it had a lot of stuff going on and surprisingly when it's not homer being the focal point of the story it had a lot going on which i enjoyed that part something that switches it up a little bit even though he was the main character of the b plot the the meat in the story was grandpa and the kids which is cool my book the simpsons a complete guide to our favorite family pointed out a few things it says the dazed and confused itchy and scratchy short was written by milk feinberg and high levine which i assume has something to do with the actual movie dazed and confused but i'm not Super nerd on that particular movie. I believe so. they actually pointed out in the commentators those were all uh, production assistants on The Simpsons Show. And then the book Lisa was reading about how to get rich writing cartoons was written by an actual Simpsons scribe, John Schwartzwilder. He had done over like 60 John episodes at this point. Yeah, he, he uh, they picked him because of how much he had contributed to the show and they wanted him to get some more recognition. And then uh, in Roger Meyer's office, Itchy and Scratchy had an ad of them drinking Dove, <laughs> which is <laughs> fucked up. 
<laughs> and then Krusty had 27 nicotine patches visible on him at one point in the episode. I think I've got and a I'm... spot right here on my ass. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and from what it points out, the attendees at the Cartoon Awards show included many, many Simpsons writers, as well as Matt Granger, if you look in the audience. So I thought that was awesome. And lastly, when Grandpa won his award, if you notice, they played the Simpsons theme while he's walking up there, <laughs> which is kind of another like meta joke, I guess. I didn't catch that. That's awesome. Yeah. Well, that is going to do it for our review of The Front. Rich, what do you want to plug this week? As always, you can follow me on Twitter. I'm at the ways underscore kid 23. Also, while you're on Twitter, go ahead and give our show a follow as well. That's at best darn diddly. That's D-I-D-D-L-Y. And you can find me online at, at Mr. Most Days Off. You can also catch my wrestling reviews of Lucha Underground over at Voices of Wrestling with Chris Novembrino. And if you are not on Twitter and you want to communicate with us, you can reach us at bestdarndiddly at gmail.com. As always, we appreciate you tuning in to the Best Darn Diddly Review Show. The WizKid and I look forward to being back with you next week where we're going to have special guest Dr. Andrew Briseño returning for the fourth time to review the episode Whacking Day. And remember, always keep your six shooters inside your garden. <laughs> Until next time, be cromulent to each other. Tune into the Dave Sanders Show every Friday at 12 p.m. Pacific time to learn about the news of the world. What the hell is that? A killer robot monster? No, Stewie. Not news of the world. The actual news of the world. I'll tell you what the news of the world is. We're in a lot of... No, Stewie, that's an album. But we are going to talk about what's going on all around the country, the world, what's hot in TV, movies, video games, hell, even sports, wrestling, pretty much anything. We're going to cover it right here on The Dave Sanders Show every Friday at 12 p.m. Pacific. Check out our Twitter at Dave Sand Show to find out when new episodes are uploaded every Friday.